Okay, let's get back to our list here. Um, 267, Catherine Oliver. Catherine Oliver. Okay. Um, 268, Maria Pelleggi. Maria Pelleggi. No, okay. Uh, 269, Dr. Vicky Obedkoff. Dr. Vicky Obedkoff, not here. Okay, 270, Athena Stradwick. 270, Athena Stradwick. All right, uh, 271, Gail Hermuses. Yeah, you're a sharp cookie. I appreciate it because I couldn't have done it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you got three minutes. Go ahead. The moment when, after many years of hard work and a long voyage, you stand in the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there and say, I own this, is the same moment when the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse. The air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. You were a visitor, time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming. We never belonged to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. Margaret Atwood. I have a question, Mayor. Uh, are the meetings founded under Robert's Rules of Order? Yes or no? Okay, just a question. Um, it was a question, simple one. I, I'm here about a couple of things. One, the Blue Night Roots. Many years ago, when I was 23, I worked out um, at Pharmacy in Eglinton, and I lived at Dundas West. And it was a two-and-a-half-hour ride home yep. at 1.30 in the morning. And my supervisor arranged for me a ride with one of my coworkers. And uh, a few, couple of months into this, uh, he's giving me a ride home. It's February. It's snowing outside. And somewhere around St. Clair and Keel, he put me out of the car because I had refused once again to have sex with him. At 2 o'clock in the morning, in the snow, in February, I was 23. I rode the Blue Night Route for a very long time. You don't have the Blue Night Route, you might as well force women to be whores for a ride. That's the truth. Suck it up. I grew up in libraries. Books were essential to my childhood. Reading often a book a day, actually sometimes more, children's books. Reading often a book a day between the ages of five and 20, and reading adult books by the time that I was 10. When I was 10, I was simultaneously reading The Bobsy Twins and Being a Nothingness by Sartre. It would have been impossible for anything other than a library to feed that hunger or my breadth of interests even though my parents were wealthy at the time. By the time I was 20, I had read at least 4,000 unique titles. Thank you. Many of Three them minutes. many that, times. Uh, any questions? Any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you very much. Mark, Mark Woodnut. Mark Woodnut. Mark Woodnut. 273, Michelle Bella Rose. 273, Michelle Bella Rose. Okay, 274, Mary McGowan. McGowan, sorry. I don't, okay, 274, Mary McGowan. Okay, 275, Jenny Gonzalez. 275, Jenny Gonzalez. Okay, 277, Beth Wilson. You have three minutes. Go ahead, Beth. Okay, there. Uh, 
Thanks very much. My name is Beth Wilson, and I'm a lifelong public library patron. And I'm here to speak to the value of public libraries. Uh, I thought the best way to make my case would be through library books that have shaped my life. And there are so many, but I only have time to share one. So uh, given the surreal nature of uh, the proceedings today, I'm going to share one by Dr. Seuss. Um, the amazing thing about Dr. Seuss books is how they engaged many of us as children and made reading fun. That is the first step to ensuring population literacy. Dr. Seuss not only delighted us, but also passed on important lessons about societal values. And it all starts at public libraries. So I'm going to read briefly from The Sneetches, which teach our children about the value of acceptance and honoring of diversity and difference. And this is a picture, I'm just going to lower it so you can see, of the Sneetches. Now the star belly Sneetches had bellies with stars. The plain belly Sneetches had none upon theirs. Those stars weren't so big, they were really so small. You might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. But because they had stars, all the star belly Sneetches would brag were the best kind of Sneetch on the beaches. With their snoots in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort. We'll have nothing to do with the plain belly sort. And whenever they met some, when they were wa out walking, they'd hike right on past them without even talking. So the story goes on to detail the social exclusion and discriminatory treatment of the <laughs> plain belly sneeches. Uh, then uh, the private sector comes into the story, and I know you guys like the private sector, so um, it's uh, the snake oil salesman comes into town, and he really capitalizes on the division between the Sneetches, and he makes a lot of money off of it, uh, and then he runs off with all their money. Uh, but in the end, and this is the spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> there is harmony uh, between the Sneetches. The day they decided that Sneetches are Sneetches, that no kind of Sneetch is the best on the beaches, that day, all the Sneetches forgot about stars and whether they had one or not upon theirs. So I share this book with you from my trusty public library to say that what Dr. Seuss did for me was start me on a path of lifelong reading and learning that opened many doors. And it all started at the public library. We need to invest in our libraries. They are places of learning, belonging, and fun. Let's build that for everyone. Thank you. No questions? See no questions? Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go down to 278, Carla Maria Lucetta, I think. I, I can hope. hardly believe my time is now. Um, I'm speaking in defense of libraries, and a lot of things that I am saying have will echo what others have said, but I thought it was important to stay. Uh, my name is Carla Lucchetta. I'm a writer, broadcaster, and book critic. I'm not here as part of any special interest group. I'm here as a citizen of Toronto and a regular user of Toronto Public Library, High Park Branch. My first ever job at the age of 14 was at Albion Library in Etobicoke, I, where I worked as a page from the ages of 14 to 17. And what started out as earning my keep at the library around the corner after my parents divorced became the spark that lit my career in writing and around books. Many of my author and writer colleagues have that same story. From the first time I stepped into a bookmobile as a kid to my days working at the library until this very day, the library is not only a vital resource, but a place where I feel an, a necessary sense of belonging and community. There's this idea that everyone has computers at home and that the almighty internet can give us every little piece of information we need, but it just isn't true. Many individuals and families don't have the money, and that's where libraries save them. At the library, everyone has access, and therefore everyone is equal. Our most vulnerable citizens rely on libraries. Low-income individuals and families, new Canadians and seniors, people living by no fault of their own on the margins. A kid having trouble in school but whose parents cannot afford a tutor can get help with their homework at the library. Children having trouble reading can sign up for help too. 
Seniors can brush up on their computer skills. Freelance or contract workers like myself who struggle with precarious income can book time with a computer or use the free Wi-Fi. I've interviewed new Canadians who have learned to read by checking out books in English, but can also happily borrow books in their own language among the many foreign language collections available. Seminars that help them learn about settling in Toronto and look for jobs are more than just helpful. They are vital to the success of immigrants in our city. As a writer and freelance or contract worker, a sector that is ever increasing in our economy, and a single income earner, there are times when my budget does not permit me to go out and buy the latest books and magazines for my research that I need for my writing. There are times when not being able to make a payment to my cable company means I'm temporarily unable to access the internet from home. Thank God the library down the street helps me keep my career going without interruption to earn money I need to pay bills. For this reason and many more, library need, libraries need to remain public, open, accessible, and free. You never know what lives are being saved and formed within their walls. Thank you very much. Questions? No questions?